Black people don't time travel. When we dream of the future, can you dream of a future 160 years from today in which black people still won't time travel? You see, today we are 161 years from the Confederate invasion of South Central Pennsylvania. When the Confederate Army entered Pennsylvania on the heels of Milroy's troops, who were fleeing Winchester, Virginia, they had thousands and thousands of enslaved people that were fleeing slavery with them. So, on the trains and wagon trains, because the Union Army fled Winchester and they had to come up here in a hurry Chambersburg's burning. This is before the Battle of Gettysburg, right? And the target of the Confederate Army was Harrisburg because it's the capital of Pennsylvania. So they were going to take over this northern state and they were going to do it by seizing the capital. And when the Union Army was in Virginia, suddenly people on all these plantations started coming to where they had their encampments. And you hear about this sometimes, you talk about contraband camps, and because that's what people who were slaves were called when they ran away during the army. They were contraband of war, something right that you steal from the enemy. And so they had contraband camps. And one thing that is not talked about is that Pennsylvania also had contraband camps. They weren't just in the South. Because it was a border state, so many people decided that they were coming north with the Union Army when they retreated. A lot of them didn't make it because the Confederate Army stole them and sold them back to the Deep South. All these people came here. They went to Reservoir Park what's Reservoir Park today, and where the Civil War Museum is, if you know that, and that's where they lived. And they lived there for decades, established communities, built, you know, what they called ramshackle huts, and, but the people had wood burning stoves, they had everything that they put, put in there. And those are some of the founding families of the black community in Harrisburg today. Pretty much anybody who's here, if your family came in at any, at in the 1800s, at any point, you're related to some of those people that came, you know, during the Civil War. And when the Confederate Army got up to Harrisburg, most of the white men who were of age to fight were already fighting in the Civil War. They weren't here. So they armed the first two groups of black men in Pennsylvania to be armed here. And they only did it for a few days. But they, ne they, never, they never decommissioned them. And, um, and so they were still in the national, you know, like Pennsylvania National Guard for the rest of their lives until they died because they were never, like they never released the unit. I can't, for some reason, the word's not coming in my head. But they were on the western side of the river and they defended their point. The Confederate Army was not able to cross. There's a, you know, a better known story of a group of black soldiers that were uh, southwest is the Susquehanna that were also armed and it was an old black man who blew up the bridge, the Wrightsville Bridge there that prevented the Confederate Army from actually getting on this side of the river and invading Harrisburg. So right it's 161 years since these black Harrisburgers made that stand to fight for freedom, for emancipation. So, when did slavery end in Pennsylvania? That's the question. 
say that you don't answer. You don't want to risk it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Easy, you want to risk it? Uh, I know you've heard me say that. So. I remember what we learned in school. You remember, what, yeah, what did you learn in school? Oh, like, man. I mean, that it was the first, the first state, state to, to, it was imagine. 1792 or so something, was what the, was. It was 1780. So 1780, 1780, Pennsylvania, PA passed the Gradual Act for Abolition. Gradual. Gradual. Not free any enslaved people. Yeah. Unborn children. <laughs> <laughs> right? No slaves freed. And every baby that was born after that had to serve. Oh, they were They're enslaved parents, masters, for a term. How long is it? Well, that depends. Mm. <laughs> it, de it depends on a number of different things. For the first 10 years, people figured out that what they could do is they could step over the border and then bring their slaves back in and they were slaves for life. So all you had to do was just take take a baby or a pregnant mom over the border, and then you could have a slave for life. So then they changed that law in 1790, so that you weren't allowed to bring people back forth out of the state. That, did, that didn't work, because who's paying attention? I mean, you know how easy it is to get away with something today, right? It was really easy then. What were you going to ask? The people that were already in slaves for life because of that, did they not become slaves? Slaves for life were slaves for life. Slaves stayed. You, you just stayed a slave, yes. You, yes, you did. So, and um, one of, you know, so I, be, like, so I believe that slavery is something that is like, it is, it lives in our bodies still. Like, it is. So, you hear those echoes of, this, of, of something that maybe you don't necessarily know what it is, right? And that echo is louder than any of the other ones. Like, they're not, it's louder than all of the people who fought, whose stories we don't know anymore. And that history, like our history, our stories seem like, they can seem like they're gone. Before I came, um, before I started doing like family history research, I had no idea how much black history is there, but nobody talks about. That is completely hidden. and. A lot of it is like, it's kind of the final, you know, it's, I, I think about it as the final frontier or it's like you're Indiana Jones because you can go anywhere and you're gonna find treasure, anywhere you look, right? You just have to go to primary sources, right? And best primary sources, sources to go to are in your own family. So, We have like, I have an example, when I was in college, I was 19 years old, and my grandmother's home care aide, she lived in Baltimore, Maryland, relapsed on crack, and um, him and his girlfriend came over to my grandmother's house, and 
took her to the bank, had her withdraw all her funds, and then they ganged her and duct taped her to the chair. It was three days before her neighbor was able to convince the police to come and look. And they could look in the mail slot and see her across from the front door in this chair. And she, you know, she was in unconscious, she was in a coma, and she did briefly regain consciousness before she died. But she, she just wasn't the same, like her mind didn't work the way it used to. And at that point when she was in the coma, we, my dad and I went to her home and I remember like, so, I mean, my grandfather's from Harrisburg and he left, he got a PhD in psychology from Penn State in the 1940s and then he started the psychology department at Morgan State um, in Baltimore. And my grandmother got her master's in mathematics at University of Maine was born and <laughs> raised in Bangor, Maine. Or something like that. I didn't know there's black people in Maine, but they have a black history too in Maine that's also been erased. So she then started the continuing education school at Morgan State. And she and my grandfather had family photos, you know, like even from, from Harrisburg, from the 1800s of his father who was a school teacher here and taught at the black school in Harrisburg. And they had them on the walls and they had all of these generations. And when I went to her house, when she was in a coma, that's what I went to go look for. Like, because that, those are our treasures, right? That's the most precious stuff that we have. And it was gone. I couldn't find any of it. And I was looking and looking and looking and looking and I, my dad's yelling, he wanted to leave before dark because he didn't know if this guy was gonna come back around and what, the, what was gonna happen. And um, I went to the, you know, I went to the basement and said goodbye to my grandfather who had already passed in spirit. That's where he used to do his model trains down in the basement. So I had to say goodbye. And I was just about to shut the door and I turned around and there was, uh, African wall hanging at the bottom of the basement stairs. And I was like, well, I gotta get that. That's something at least, you know? And I took it down and there was a compartment hollowed out from the basement wall and it had all of our family letters, photos, photo albums, old pieces of fabric, like that were from the 1800s and it was this incredible wealth of information and artifacts. There's, um, I brought some, but it's, that it, um, I couldn't like at that time, at that time, I didn't know like who a lot of the people were that they were writing about or you know the places that they were talking about and there was no you know there was no internet like we have it now there was no ancestry.com there was nothing like that you know, that you could just look something up and understand who and find out who people were in the 19 years 19 years after that the, it, things changed a lot. And all of a sudden you did have those resources and I could start piecing together the names and the places and the organizations and everything that were in this treasure archive that, that I found behind that wall. And that's when I say black people start to time <coughs> That's when we want to time travel because in those pieces that you find and the pieces that you can connect with technology, that's where our true, like our true history is and our true stories are, right? Like 
in school, what did you learn the Underground Railroad was? A way to get from one point of freedom, one spot to the next. Who ran the Underground Railroad? Harriet Tubman. She <laughs> ran it. <laughs> I mean, that's the most yeah. famous. That's what's the, what yeah. was her role? What do you call it? Cap, like the captain, the conductor, the conductor, right? Yeah, yeah. And then what were the other roles on the Underground Railroad? Oh. There's a conductor, right? What else is there? It was set up like a train almost, right? Like the position was how a train would work. So you have a conductor, and that person moves. Right, you have a conductor. What else do you have? The people that hit the slaves. Station master? Oh. Yes. Station master? Yes, you got station master. And what else do we have? Uh, people, the people that gave them. Well, they ever take their freedom. I mean, there's no like, we can get it. No, what do you no like put them back into like society when they got back, like to the end of the train. To the end of like to their destination, right? Yeah. What's that person called? I don't know. Yeah. What do you call the people that are escaping? You call them the engine. engine. Okay. Or passengers. But usually passengers was a term like that they used to write like station masters and for example William Still, right? He ran the Underground Railroad for Pennsylvania. And he would say, I have eight passengers I'm sending to you. But he also said, it's like, the Underground Railroad is powered by the engine. And the engine are, is like slaves that are escaping. There would be no Underground Railroad without the engine. That's what makes it run. So, I mean, in school you learned that the Underground Railroad was, who, who helped slaves escape, right? Who were they? Yeah, what do they look like? Usually it's like Quakers, white people that are depicted. Right. And but how many people do you think that missing. were involved in the Underground Railroad and helping escaping slaves were white? Like what percentage do you think? Good question. I think I, up until this point, I thought 100%. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm not going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's probably that's probably more like it. <laughs> it's just whose story you get, whose stories get told. All right. So if I say this, what does that mean? Right. I mean, I look at the allies part like people who didn't publicly say or speak out against you, but help. Backside, I guess. My Abolitionists are black. Oh. Abolitionists are black. Uh huh. Okay. So that's totally that's totally different. First of all, because that's not what you well, well, hear, yeah, right? right. Abolitionists yeah. like you're like oh, oops. Oh, yeah. oh, 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 oh. And all the ancestors. So yeah, abolitionists are black. So you have to it, sometimes like I'll say now like I'll say white abolitionists, right? But that's gonna be, you know, at best guess, those, the white people who were assisting enslaved people from to escape slavery were less than 6%. Mm -hmm. Wow. And that's not including the engine. The vehicles. The engine, meaning like the people. The people who escaping. Were escaping. Okay. Because and that also is like you are, when you're on the Underground Railroad, you had to get to the north before the Underground Railroad really kicked in on your own. You had to get to the north. Because it wasn't in none of the states below a certain point though, right? Right. 
You had to get to like. You had to get here. You had to get you, Pennsylvania. Right. You you know you had to get pretty far north, right, in order for it to 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 really kick in. That is really what makes one of the things that makes Harriet Tubman's story remarkable is that she was going back down south and getting people from where they lived and bringing them north. Most people did not get get out. No, most people did not get out that way. You just walked, right? You went out. You went out the door one day and you walked, or you hid in the attic of a friend sometimes for years, and then tried to find a time when it was safe for you to go. You went into the woods next to the plantation and you hid in a hollow tree again sometimes for years on your own. People would sneak you food. You know, sometimes you would have to. You'd get too cold in the winter and you go back to the plantation. And then you try again. People who were enslaved is, tried to escape tons of times. You would go again and again and again and again, right? And rebel. You also have, you know, I mean, I'm gonna focus, it's Harrisburg, so the the place where we were, I started talking about this earlier, where we are right now is on top of the oldest black neighborhood in Harrisburg, called Judy's Town. And Judy's Town was run by a man named Edward, they called him King Bennett. And he controlled Judy's Town and William Pat Jones, Dr. Jones, controlled the other black neighborhood, which was closer to the river. And you had these two black communities, and they were where the Underground Railroad went worked in this area. Dr. Jones came to Harrisburg in 1822 on a raft, on a coal raft. He had 12 tons of coal and all of his household furniture and his wife and his kids on this raft. And came up, you know, up the Susquehanna on the raft and was like sold all you know sold the, sold all the coal, bought himself a house, and then apprenticed himself to a pharmacist, and that's why he was Doctor Jones. Then, when the Fugitive Slave Act passed in 1850, he left the doctor's business and he started fixing stoves all around the countryside. And he would pick up rags, take his cart around, go from place to place with this big rag cart and stove parts because he was a conductor on the Underground Railroad. And that's how he did that, how he concealed it and could move freely. That's how a lot of people did it in Pennsylvania. With So Pennsylvania has the most complete information about the Underground Railroad in the country. William Still, because it's still. Yeah. William Still kept journals every time. And you see, if you saw the Harriet Tubman movie, you know the man that she meets in Philadelphia? That's William Still, right? And he's real. <laughs> and, um, and he kept journals. He would interview everyone when they came, and he would ask them, who was your owner? What's your name? Who were your parents? Do you... Who did you have to like? Who did you have to leave behind, and why did you leave? And he recorded it in his journal because he felt like that was his mother had escaped slavery and had to leave her children, two of her children, behind. Right? What was the number of the people? Like how many people did he record? Well, he destroyed four of the journals. Really? Why? Because. Um, when, right before the Civil War, he was afraid of what would happen if they got into the wrong hands. And then the other journals, he hid in a black cemetery. And Do you think he could hide all of them? I think he had destroyed, no. <laughs> For some reason he didn't. Or, I mean, I would think he could if you put it in a coffin, but maybe the other ones had some more information that he wanted to protect. I'm not, you know, I'm not 100% sure. But he did save those, you know, the last three, and he published 
the first book published on the Underground Railroad anywhere. Mm. Right? I just learned this like two years ago. I'm like, I had, I mean, I, I'm like, how did you, how do you learn hear about the Underground Railroad too every single year? It's Black History Month. It's Black History Month, and you don't hear about all of these stories about the Underground Railroad and what we did on it. And it's always that it's this mystery that can't be solved, right? We'll never know. We'll never know the true story of the Underground Railroad or who was really active in it because there are no records because they're secretive. But you go to that primary source document, you go to William Still's journals, you go to the book that he wrote, you go to newspaper articles that were published during that time, and all of a sudden it's not so secret anymore. It's not a story that can't be revealed. And that is what gets us to the future. Right? <laughs> That's what gives us the future because we still need those same networks and we need the knowledge of the networks, right? The reason why we don't have this history and why we don't know this story is to keep us weak, right? Like it's to disconnect you from the, this root strength, the knowledge that People that weren't people even, weren't even considered people, were powerful enough to drive and create the, like the greatest underground movement of all time, the Underground Railroad, right? That were kept ignorant, illiterate, that had no money, that supposedly had no names, that faceless giant mass of, of under, indeterminate number of slaves that got free on the Underground Railroad by, with white helpers and Quakers, you know, that group, that they all had names, that they powered this network, that they communicated and worked together underground and above ground. Yeah. And a lot of times above ground at, for free black people who were living in Pennsylvania and elsewhere, those people risked everything that they had to end slavery and to get enslaved people to freedom. Most of them did. Now there's, there are some bad actors too, but you know, who did not, um, who, there's a couple bad guys. In Pennsylvania, I know of a couple in Adams County, but most of them did that. And they, whenever people came, when slave hunters came and slave owners came, and they were like, "Oh, that guy's, those guys are my slaves," they would go and they would get, they would fight for for those people to get free. So we had two what they called slave riots in Harrisburg. The first one was in the 1830s. The second one was in the 1850s, which is like not as well known. Again, they're not as well known as the Christiana riot, for example. Um, but the same man that I was talking about earlier from Judystown, King Bennett, Edward King Bennett, and Dr. William Pat Jones, and a number of other you know men who most of them were property owners and they owned several properties and had businesses around Harrisburg, they stormed the jail and you know, bought all sorts of you know, clubs and stuff like that to prevent the slave catchers from taking these three black men back into slavery. And the first time in the 1830s, they were successful in helping one of the men escape but the other two were recaptured and sold back into slavery. Um, and for their punishment, the city of Harrisburg built a treadmill and sentenced them to 18 days on this treadmill. And if you don't know what a treadmill is, it's this giant wheel that they had you know, designed in England to punish prisoners. 
They were like, it would keep them from being idle. But it injured too many prisoners. And the US was like, South Carolina was like, oh, that sounds like a great idea. We know we'll, what we could use that for, right? And it was, it's like you had to walk kind of like a hamster, like a little bit like a hamster wheel, but like with steps, but there's gaps in between. So if you don't keep moving, then your limbs fall down in and break in the wheel, you know? And you would have to go on this thing 24 hours a day. And they were sentenced to 18 days on the treadmill. And that's what happened in the 1830s. And that was every single one of those men who was sentenced on the treadmill, and it was 13, were the wealthiest black property owners in the city. Hmm in the 1830s. Every single one of them. They're like, hmm. that's kind of, you know, yeah, we know that story. We know that story. So the tech that helped us piece things back together. I gotta get off this so I can show you. Um, Do any of you family history research? I yeah. tried, but I think mine was just when I was younger, just asking and my family dynamic is a little different because um, I got great aunts, a lot of great aunts that's, that were still alive. Yes. And uh, just me as a kid, uh, they tell us that we come from South Carolina, but it would be like, That's why, yeah, not to not see them. Right. But I mean, like I'm, with my, you know, with my grandmother's the things that I found in her basement, it's like so much of the history of my family, which I'm like, I used to ask a lot of questions of my grandparents and listen to the stories. And my dad has barely any interest at all in, you know, the family history. He will listen. But he always said to us that we were like, he was the last of both of his family lines, you know, and that he had no first cousins, no second cousins, no third cousins, nothing, no siblings, right? And I was just like, that is, I, I just can't believe that there's nobody else. How could there be nobody else, you know? And um, so we did DNA testing. I did DNA testing on my dad, and it turns out it's not, um, He's not the only one, and we still have family here in Harrisburg. And that's what brought us back. But doing that research, it also led me to finding who you know my enslaved ancestors were, and what their names are, and what their parents' names are, right? And that in genealogy research, we talk about like there's an 1870 brick wall, and that that brick wall is the 1870 census, which is the first one where enslaved ancestors are named and that you can't get beyond that because you don't have you don't have um, any records with their names on it if you go back before that but we do have records there are records that have their names and they're later they're also in those primary sources that we we're talking about earlier a lot of slaveholders they like to keep journals diaries and then they come from big wealthy families and they donate all of these things to different historical societies and libraries. And that's where our black ancestors' names and parts of their stories are written is in those diaries, believe it or not. Like, but black ancestors, white ancestors lived together. They lived and all of all of these lives are intertwined. So you have the stories of these people in the diaries and the wills and estate inventories of white slaveholding families, but they're fragmented and dehumanized in the stories 
Right. It's not until people start listening and they start writing and telling the stories in their own way and that's recorded that you start to get a glimpse in their own voice of what their lives are like. We can piece those things back together too and you can add the pieces together and look in your own self, listen to that history. Like we talked about right at the beginning, talking about we carry the memory of slavery in our bodies. We carry it with us, right? We carry from that moment as black Americans are born on the middle passage, right? Before that, you're African. Then you're black. You're, and everything is erased from there except it's not always erased because people pass that memory and we carry it in us. We know what that, what parts of that feel like. So black people don't time travel because we're still connected to that past. We're also connected to that, to that future that we dream, that we've always dreamed, right? That memory of being free the memory of we have family and we know we have family. That's a, that's a thread that's there and always with us too. It's just getting to that point where we can pull the threads together, like all of them from both directions, from the future, from now and from the past and tell the stories that empower us like a Nazi. And I think I'm gonna be out of time, but we started late. Um, in Costa, when we were younger, like we were taken to the places where the underground railroad, like the underground tunnels uh, were at throughout Costa. So we, we as kids knew that house, we knew that house right here or that house. Cause like your parents and yeah, stuff? I mean, yeah. even like this, this City itself would have a day. I don't know. I think they don't do it no more. Mm. But it was like tour, a tour thing because it was started the school. So the school used to be a small little one room school, and it had passages under it that led to what is now the, the Veterans Hospital up on the hill. Mm. That had like four, four or five different break off passages that went under the new school and all of that under, mm. under uh, a little place called Harbor Court. So. We actually, I remember going to houses and going down in the basement and lifting up doors and then being shown, you know, the flashlight. This is a fragmented piece of this lady's house that she used to hide slaves here and boom, boom, boom. Hmm. I, they definitely don't do that no more, but the house yeah. is, is house. Is I mean, part of the reason, I mean, like, most of most Underground Railroad, like, stations and stuff did not have hiding places. Like, and so, and there's, but there was a period of time where that's mostly what they were telling you is that, you know, that there's a passage or something like that. But they didn't have hiding places because they were at black people's houses in black communities and they didn't need to hide them because they were just with all the other black people. And, you know, and so they didn't need to hide them. They would just move them when danger came nearby people who were really important on the Underground Railroad were barbers, and all barbers were black, pretty much. Before, you know, 1865, all the barbers, white bar, like white barbers that cut white hair were black men, right? And they were, they owned oyster saloons and restaurants, all places where people go and talk. So, all of these black men who were leaders in the community as barbers and restauranteurs and oyster men, they knew most of the time what was about to go down before it went down and they could move people out, you know, of wherever they were hiding. They also had semi-white allies in powerful places. Most of these men I'm not talking about like as white allies, like they were supportive of abolition because some of them were even slave owners themselves or had been or 
at some time in the past in Pennsylvania and other places, but they were friends because they liked their barber. They were friends like, oh, I like my barber. He's a good barber. I don't want him to go to jail. He's, he's a good man. And so they could also, they were protected a little bit because they had people in powerful places that would speak up for them, you know, but that's like, that's another part of it. So we are, our organization does black cemetery restoration, saving our ancestors legacy, genealogy research, researching and telling the stories of all of the black people that we can, <laughs> um, hidden stories, untold stories. Like, you know, there's, if you go to the website, you can read a story about, they called him Black Dick. He saved thousands of lives at the Harrisburg train station. He was a giant and a simple simpleton, they called him. Um, an idiot, they called him. Seven feet tall, over seven feet tall. He died at the age of around 38, but he saved thousands and thousands of lives from the trains from being run over. And because you had to cross at grade to all these different stops and trains would like run over people all the time. He would run in front of them and move them out of the way. So his obituary was published all across the country, in the South, in California, in Oregon, all the way up in Maine, you know, he died when he died in 1872. But you don't see that when you go to the go to the Harrisburg train station. I went this morning and just checked to see if it says his name anywhere. And it doesn't. We're, we're rocking. Yeah. So um I say I'm excited about weaving those threads back together, developing new technology, new platforms. I use AI and machine learning to help make those connections to and a new, this new technology, which I've been working with a team to develop for over four years that can map all of those connections and invite everyone from the, as a crowdsourced network a crowdsourced platform to, to write black history, to share your family stories and your, your archives, the treasures, and put all of the pieces of our past back together again, because we have to be the ones to tell our stories because no one else is gonna tell them. And now we have the tools to do it. So, that's, unfortunately, I gotta finish, and I didn't get to do the speech, but we had a good, a good fit, so. <laughs> if what I'm packing up, if you guys have any questions, too, I could answer them, so. Please take a, take a brochure and um, come. We have our, we have a volunteer rest, cemetery restoration weekend this weekend at Harrisburg's Oldest Black Cemetery, which is Lincoln Cemetery. Well over 10,000 African American ancestors are buried in there. Um, we restore headstones, dig them out of the ground when they're sunk, sometimes five feet down under the ground, and read the names and tell the story. So come by, tell everybody you know about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.